Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first uh, COVID seminar of our mini series on behalf of the Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalization and the Deakin Science and Society Network. I'd like to uh, first acknowledge the traditional owners, the Aboriginal traditional owners of the lands on which I'm standing, the Kulin Nations and the Indigenous traditional owners of all the places where you are listening from. It's an absolute pleasure to introduce Priscilla Wald, who is the Florence Brinkley Professor of English and the Professor of Gender, Sexuality and Feminist Studies at Duke University. She is the author of Contagious, Cultures, Carriers and the Outbreak Narrative, published by Duke University Press in 2008 and incredibly uh, prescient of the current moment. And it is also uh, open access at the moment. Duke has made a whole collection of um, pandemic related literature open access, which is uh, quite amazing. So um, Priscilla, I'll hand over to you to present uh, for about uh, uh, 35 to 40 minutes, um, really bringing us up to date on um, what um, your very long engagement with uh, with the outbreak narrative uh, means for the moment that we're in now. Um, so for those uh, on the YouTube site, you can see the, the chat function there. Uh, do check that you can, um, that you are signed up properly to put in questions into the chat function and we will uh, pass them on. Also, if you're on Twitter, you can uh, put questions up there. So Priscilla. Thank you. And thank you all for joining me here tonight. I don't think I have to tell you that a pandemic is a world changing event. Um, I came to this work originally because I witnessed the early years of the HIV pandemic in New York City. And obviously that was a very different pandemic. It didn't radically stop day-to-day -day interactions worldwide, although in some communities and populations it did. Um, and it was, it was a disease that was more mysterious, harder to trace, very long incubation periods. It took a long time to even identify very few of the early people affected survived. So it, each pandemic has its own signature, its own um, um, way of being in the world. But there's a particular story that I've identified that we tell of about um, catastrophic communicable disease. And I call it the outbreak narrative. It's the topic of my lecture tonight or my seminar tonight. And I'm interested in this story because I think it affects the way we understand the problem of catastrophic communicable disease. It affects everything from survival and transmission rates to medical outcomes. Of course, it has geopolitical and economic consequences. Now, obviously COVID-19 is the backdrop for this talk and it's not clear how we're gonna tell that story. We won't know until we have some kind of end. There will be some end to this event. Um, and we won't know what the story is gonna look like until that time or perhaps a bit later. But I think if we look at the outbreak nar narrative now and at its paradigmatic features, its conventions, it might help us understand the experience we're going through now and perhaps allow us to change the story and in changing the story, possibly make a difference um, to this kind of event and its outcomes. And I'm gonna end by talking about some of the ways we might tell this story differently in order ideally to prevent outbreaks from becoming full-fledged pandemics, or if they do, to make us better prepared and uh, possibly able to deal with them more effectively and ideally more equitably. So with that, I want to, sorry, um, show a clip, which is the trailer from the Steven Soderbergh 2011 film Contagion, which I imagine many of you have watched either again or for the first time. And I think it's a, a good uh, introduction to this genre. Oops, sorry. There we go. It's a groundbreaking ceremony for a new factory. 
Did you mention seeing anyone who was sick? Anyone on a plane at the airport? Mm. She said she was jet lagged. The average person touches their face three to five times every waking minute. In between, we're touching doorknobs, water fountains, and each other. Matt. Go up to your room, honey. So we have a virus. No treatment protocol and no vaccine this time. You had a seizure this morning, Beth. She had a history of seizures. No, no, no. Allergies. As of last night, there were 32 cases. Unfortunately, she did die. All right. Excuse me. Can I go talk to her? Mr. Amos, your wife is dead. What are you talking about? What happened to her? What happened to her? Is there any way someone could weaponize the bird flu? Is that what we're looking at? Someone doesn't have to weaponize the bird flu. The birds are doing that. Watch this. It's transmission. So we just need to know which direction. On day one, there were two people, and then four, and then 16. In two months, it's a billion. That's where we're heading. They're calling out the National Guard. They're moving the president underground. People will tell it. It will tip over. The truth is being kept from the world. Put your samples, destroy everything. Hello. I need you to get me the names of everyone who serviced this room. It's an emergency. You can't panic now. I know. I'm going to get you home. I got people too, Dr. Cheever. We all do. Don't talk to anyone. Don't touch anyone. Stay away from other people. We're not sick. It's figuring us out faster than we're figuring it out. It's mutating. So the question I want to start with is what is so appealing about this narrative, this story? If a story is paradigmatic, if it gets told over and over again, it's doing some kind of important work. It's been described as a thriller. It's certainly a medical thriller. It's a detective story, this genre. Um, and this one is a, I think they're all disaster films. This, it's not a coincidence that this film uh, first showed two days prior to the 10th anniversary of the 9-11 World Trade Center bombings. But I also think it's appealing, the outbreak narrative in general is appealing in another way. And that is that I think it is expressing our nebulous anxieties about globalization and development and how it's changing our social interactions and human relations. And you could see even from the trailer that Gwyneth Paltrow plays the, obviously the patient zero, the index case. And she is um, a, a mother and wife, but she's also a high power corporate executive. She's sent halfway around the world to Asia. We're meant to see this, I think, as an exotic place with questionable hygiene, she served food that is not properly prepared, and she becomes the patient zero of a worldwide pandemic of a disease that has a profound mortality rate, exponentially more than COVID-19. I don't think anybody in the film gets sick and survives. There's some people who are immune, but I don't think there are any survivors that I remember. And um, and you know, the, there's a, a kind of pathologizing of certain places and behaviors. There's a scene in the film where she's on her way home and she extends her stay over, her layover rather, in the Chicago airport in order to have a liaison, quick liaison with a former paramour who's a politician. There's something illicit about their relationship, at least that's suggested. And that really has no bearing on the film at all. Sure, it's another place that she seeds an outbreak, but they're all, all over the world at this point, so it wouldn't have mattered. But it's a way of pathologizing her behavior. She's supposed to be at home as a wife and mother. What is she doing halfway around the world? What has she brought back to her family? But I also think there's a mythic dimension to the outbreak narrative, and that is it's, a, it's a, an apocalyptic struggle. These narratives have, or, I'm sorry, the diseases have to be species threatening. You wouldn't have an outbreak narrative about the way a cold circulates. It has to be really dangerous. And so it becomes a struggle between medical science and, and epidemiology on one hand, which represents the best of, of human in ingenuity, 
versus the microbe, which represents the forces of nature that are mysterious and incomprehensible. And they're struggling over the fate of humanity. And ultimately, it's not an outbreak narrative if it doesn't resolve, if there's not someone left to tell the story. So ultimately, there are survivors and humanity gets a second chance. It's, it's rejuvenating in the way that myth is. And part of the reason it works that way, I think, is because there's an inherent fascination with contagion. So this is a more mundane version. This is a, a sen an opening sentence from a global health textbook called The Politics of Global Health Governance United by Contagion. And it's, it says health is, an, is the ultimate unifying issue for humankind and health becomes oddly synonymous here specifically with communicable disease, right? Contagion. Uh, the world is becoming an ever smaller place and microbes that cause devastating diseases do not stop for border guards. So on the one hand, we are united by contagion because we're all susceptible and because we're all in contact with each other. However big the world gets, it's also shrinking, we're interconnected. But we also pose a danger to each other. And it continues, more and more we are coming to understand that people with diseases located anywhere from down the street to the other side of the globe have important and varied impacts on our well-being. Health has become more than a medical issue. It's also a development issue, commercial issue, humanitarian issue, and a security issue. So what, we're, what, what I think is that uh, what we're being told is that contagion is in effect an analog for what it means to be human. We are social beings, we need each other, we're in constant contact with each other, and therefore we also pose a risk to each other. And I think I love the slogans that have been going up in my neighborhood and I'm sure elsewhere, we are all in this together, right? That's been the slogan. But I particularly like the Duke sign on the uh, trail across the street from me. We're in this together, keep your distance. So um, I'm gonna turn now to the outbreak narrative proper. And I have two starting points for this narrative. The first is the declaration of Alma Ada, which came out of a conference organized in September, 1978 by the World Health Organization and UNICEF. As you see, delegates from 134 nations and 67 UN organizations. And they were united to discuss the uh, problem of global health. And it was inspired by programs in the global south, um, like the Barefoot uh, Doctors Program in China, where there was a real commitment to the UN definition of health as a fundamental human right. And health meant not just the absence of disease, but a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, proper shelter, proper nutrition, and access to uh, universal access to primary health care. And the declaration, all of the attendant, attendees um, signed the declaration to work to achieve universal access by the year 2000. Now, in Australia, you already have this. In the United States, we are very, very far from this, so why not? It's one of the questions I'll be asking and I'm gonna come back uh, near the very end of the um, talk to uh, the Declaration of Alma Ada. The other starting point is the place where the actual conventions of the outbreak narrative began and that was a 1989 conference in Washington DC organized by Joshua Lederberg, who's an epidemiologist and um, microbiologist and it was at the end of the decade when HIV had made its way around the globe, puncturing what had been real sanguinity in the medical community about communicable disease that uh, was, really, was inspired by the eradication of smallpox, naturally occurring smallpox in the 70s, among other things. And doctors really didn't believe, medical researchers, epidemiologists didn't believe communicable disease moving forward was gonna be a significant threat to the species. And um, the CDC in the United States, which had emerged to deal with communicable disease, began to look at epidemics of things like obesity and drug addiction and that sort of thing, because really communicable disease, we'd solve that problem. But all the while they were proclaiming that, these horrific, hemorrhagic fevers, newly emergent diseases were surfacing all over the globe in very remote communities and hadn't really caught people's attention broadly until of course HIV. And so this collection of people got together and they 
coined the term disease emergence and described it as a phenomenon that was a consequence of globalization and development patterns. On the one hand, the population was growing and we were spreading into areas uh, and encountering microbes to which we had no herd immunity, no immunity at all because we hadn't encountered them before. And on the other hand, the world was shrinking. We were becoming increasingly interconnected because of patterns of globalization. And so they said, you know, the solution here couldn't just be with epidemiology and medical science, but really we had to address, we had to change, radically change our broad practices of globalization and development and our day-to-day -day practices of how we were living in the world. So from this, and what I look at in my work is how certain conventions emerged from the science and the middle two um, books there are collections of essays that came out of this conference, how they, it emerged from the science into scientific journalism, the mainstream media, and eventually popular fiction and film. And it put into circulation certain visual images, textual images, and narrative plot lines. And this is what I call the outbreak narrative. So what I'm gonna show you now, I'm gonna start with my final film clip, which is the opening scene of the 1995 Wolfgang Peterson film, Outbreak, which along with uh, Richard Preston's 1994 New Yorker piece, which became um, a book, The Hot Zone, people call it a novel. It is a sensational, it is sensational journalism. It's not a novel. Um, but those two things really put this vocabulary of outbreak and bio, bio levels and so on uh, into circulation. So here is the opening of the outbreak. Let's see, where is my, oops, it's not it. There we go. And I want you to notice the opening shot. And the opening shot is a bird's eye view that becomes an establishing shot. And that means you start up in the treetops at what looks like a very pastoral or not pastoral, but idyllic scene, very peaceful. And you move into a place and a lot of outbreak narratives start with this bird's eye view, almost like a classical omen of flying birds that comes down into a place to tell you something really amiss is happening here. It's a pathologizing gesture. So you see this beautiful forest. And then what's lying beneath it. men dead yesterday, 18 the day before. We need supplies, plasma, medicine. I'll get you everything you need, doctor. You Americans, please give me hell of this shit hole. Hey, that's what we're here for. We're going to take you home. But first, we're going to take a little blood sample, all right? Die, right? No, you're not going to die. Tell my girl I love her. You're not going to tell her. You're going to tell her yourself, all right? The soldiers inside are in the early stages of the disease. By tomorrow night, they will look like this. Oh, my God. I'll authorize an immediate air drop, doctor. Mm -hmm. It's even worse than I thought. Get the plane here by 1900 hours. Uh, shouldn't we at least the plane, Billy?
So um, I open with that because as I say, it really is what put a lot of these conventions into circulation. And what you saw was a few things. There's something I call the geography of disease where um, the problem moves from the global south to the global north and expertise moves in the opposite direction. And uh, this is an image of, of what I think of of expertise. So the Zairean doctor is taking um, Donald Sutherland and Morgan Freeman over to look at these horrific images, this, um, these bodies. And he says, you know, those men that you just saw were in the early stages of this disease, but within two days, they'll look like this. He pulls the tarp. We expect to see something horrible. The camera does a 180 degree turn and we see the image mediated through the visor of Donald Sutherland. And he is the figure of expertise. He's gonna tell us what the problem is and how to deal with it. Um, he's gonna show us that, uh, that this, this um, problem, uh, because we're so interconnected, it has to be contained, that there are certain lives that need to be sacrificed as casualties of war. And for him, the Zairans and the men in the, in the camp, uh, the um, uh, mercenaries are casualties of war and he's gonna contain the threat. And the film is all about that containment, but shifting more compassionately when uh, the same uh, disease hits a Northern California town 20 years later and Donald Sutherland wants to literally nuke the town. And he says, well, you know, people say, but what about the people? He says, they're casualties of war. And the response is, but these are Americans, sir. Um, and so of course, uh, Donald, uh, I'm sorry, Dustin Hoffman becomes the, the solution, the person who figures out how to make a vaccine out of one monkey that's, you know, available to everybody in less than 18 months. Uh, not possible. So we see um, networks, we see who's expendable, we see the notion of uh, containment. So what I'm going to move to now is I'm going to show you uh, exactly how, what conventions moved from the science into the journalism, into the main, mainstream, uh, into uh, popular fiction and film, and how this story surfaced. I'm going to try to get through this quickly. So I've mentioned that the disease has to be apocalyptic or the outbreak narrative isn't gonna work. The stakes have to be very high. It's all about interdependence and the geography of disease. So I've talked about the shift from south to north of the threat and north to south of the solution, but it's also that like science, and this is from one of the uh, collections coming out of the conference, emerging viruses know no country. There are no barriers to prevent their migration across international boundaries or around the 24 time zones. And for Richard Preston, sensational journalism, this becomes a hot virus in the rainforest, lives within a 24 hour plane flight from every city on earth. All of the earth's cities are connected by web of airline routes. The web is a network. Once a virus hits the net, it can shoot anywhere in a day, Paris, Tokyo, New York, LA, wherever planes fly. And I wanna just go down to the bottom. Lori Garrett who's a wonderful really terrific science journalist who wrote the book, The Coming Plague, that came directly out of the conference, um, describes it this way, the Andromeda strain nearly surfaced in Africa in the form of Ebola virus. Megacities were arising in the developing world, creating niches from which virtually anything might arise. Rainforests were being destroyed, forcing disease carrying animals and insects into areas of human habitation and raising the very real possibility that lethal mysterious microbes would for the first time infect humanity on a large scale and imperil the survival of the human race. Now I wanna be very clear, I have great respect for uh, the science journalist, Laura Garrett, as I've said, is terrific. Um, and for the um, uh, participants in the 1989 conference. And I think, you know, what I'm looking at is the way that our, what our language can tell us about assumptions we don't know we have. And I ha as I say, I have great respect for them. I'm not criticizing them by looking at what their language is doing. I'm watching how a discourse emerges, right? So I'm building on the work of cognitive anthropologists, cognitive linguists, discourse analysts, rhetoricians, et cetera. We all, I do it all the time. I use metaphors that I'm not aware of. And what these, uh, what the language can tell us is assumptions and biases we're not aware of, but also how concepts circulate and become conventions that shape the way an entire group thinks about a problem. So Larry Garrett uses the Andromeda strain, which is something I see all the time 
in the science that's coming out of this conference. And of course, it's a reference to Michael Crichton's 1969 novel, The Andromeda Strain, the film that came out of it. But it always surfaces in Africa or the jungles of Africa or Asia. It's not something that would happen, let's say, in Lyme, Connecticut. Um, not every place is a place from, uh, from which virtually anything might arise. And it's very interesting because hantavirus, which was one of these lethal viruses, there was a hantavirus outbreak in the United States in, the mid, uh, in 1994 in the Southwest, which was exactly the landscape that the Andromeda strain took place. And yet the Andromeda strain is not used to describe it. So it's a way of pathologizing certain spaces that has a lot to do, more to do with geopolitics than the actual history of these diseases. Although of course it is built um, on certain experiences. The second convention is that the microbe is animated. It becomes the enemy. And you, I'm sure you've all heard uh, the, the comparison now that's being made to um, we're at war with COVID-19. We're at war with the SARS-CoV-2 microbe. And I'm gonna talk a little more about that in a bit, but microbial warfare, again, is a metaphor that the scientists use routinely to describe this problem and that gets picked up and um, run with. And I think Joshua Lederberg actually, actually helps to explain why when he talks about the challenge of accommodating for human beings to the reality that nature is far from benign. At least it has no special sentiment for the welfare of the human versus other species. The survival of the human species is not a preordained evolutionary program. And you know, we don't want to believe, as he says in the epigraph to the film, that a virus can threaten the survival of the human race. How is that possible? That this thing that's not even fully alive can possibly be, as they say a lot in um, the hot zone, outsmarting us. And so there's a kind of dignity involved in thinking about it as warfare. There's um, the ability or the effort to make sense of what's happening and to figure out how to fight it. Let's fight it the way we'd fight a war, right? With all kinds of, throwing all kinds of things at it. And so tracking that down, um, Richard Krauss, who's one of the attendees of the conference talks about microbes as not idle bystanders waiting for new opportunities offered by human mobility, ignorance or neglect. They possess remarkable genetic versatility that enables them to develop new pathogenic vigor to escape population immunity by acquiring new antigens and develop antibiotic resistance. They are more than simple opportunists. They have also been great innovators and Richard Preston, viruses are molecular sharks, emotive without a mind, compact, hard, logical, totally selfish, dedicated to making copies of itself, which it can do on occasion with radiant speed. The prime directive is to replicate. So from these animated microbes, and of course, think about again, what the message of the conference and also in a different way of Alma Ada is supposed to be right? We are responsible for these events. We human beings, we are creating the circumstances that have created, that have uh, produced these outbreaks and turned them into pandemics. But by displacing it onto the microbe, we are disclaiming a certain amount of that um, responsibility. The us them in many ways is a very significant feature of the outbreak narrative. And once we've animated the microbe, it's very easy to shift the blame onto a particular population where presumably um, the uh, outbreak started. So Barbara Culleton, another terrific science journalist, talks about Sol virus as an unwelcome immigrant, a cousin of Asian Hantin virus, which causes hemorrhagic fever. So, you know, again, not really thinking about something, the language that you're using, but so much being revealed in that language about how we think about these problems and how those, uh, those concepts circulate. And if you'll see at the bottom of your screen, Madeline Drexler, also science journalist, um, in her book, Secret Agents, talks about, and, and post 9-11, terrorists have become the best um, metaphor for viruses. So she talks about viruses as secret agents that shadow ecological change everywhere, nature's undercover operatives hijacking the cell's metabolic machinery, a wireless communication system that enables microbes to coordinate their activities. Once you've animated the microbe, it's a very easy step to make it mystical, supernatural. And uh, 
uh, Richard Preston talks about one of the scientists that was working on uh, the Ebola um, outbreak in a, in a simian facility, holding facility in out zone, in, in hot zone. Um, and Tom Geispert, it looks into the electron microscope and sees white cobras tangled among themselves like the hair of Medusa. They were the face of nature herself, the obscene goddess revealed naked. This life form thing was breathtakingly beautiful. As he stared at it, he found himself being pulled out of the human world into a world where moral boundaries blur and finally dissolve completely. He was lost in wonder and admiration even though he knew that he was the prey. So it's taking on a supernatural, almost religious and definitely mystical dimension. And it's a very easy step then for the microbe to become the spokesperson for an injured earth. And Carl Johnson, one of the conference participants refers to the earth as a progressively immunocompromised ecosystem. Richard Preston picks that up. The biosphere may not like the idea of 5 billion humans or perhaps the human species is just so much meat that cannot defend itself against a life form that might want to consume it. The Earth's immune system, so to speak, has recognized the presence of the human species and is starting to kick in. And one of the problems that I think with this metaphor, and there are several, is again, this sort of us theming, the, the dissociation of human responsibility, but also um, how environmentalism is looked at. And, you know, climate change, environmental devastation, all of these things are contributing to the factors that produce outbreaks and turn them into pandemics. Um, so to demonize the earth in this way um, is again, troubling. Um, and uh, one of the things that happens, one of the reasons I love looking at popular culture is that one of the things that novels and films do something that in the science, like microbial warfare. And you might say, you know, microbial warfare, think about your assumptions. Think about the message you're trying to get across and what that statement actually says. People say, oh, come on, it's a metaphor. Who takes that seriously? What popular fiction, popular culture does is, is take like a magnifying glass to the metaphor and blows it up into an extended scenario so that you can really see what these the implications of this way of thinking are. And in one of my favorite of the outbreak narratives or the uh, popular novels that I looked at is Chuck Hogan's Blood Artist. It, it touches, it hits every base of the outbreak narrative. And this is a case where two CDC researchers are trying to track um, a human hybrid microbe or a virus. So a virus infects and of course environmentalists and many of the demons are environmentalists. Virus infects an environmentalist um, it, um, uh, it's attenuated, so it doesn't kill him, but it turns him into this hybrid virus in environmentalist creature they call patient zero. And patient zero is seeding outbreaks all over the world in order to reduce the human population on behalf of mother earth. So these two CDC guys are tracking him and uh, Marek thinks the threat of a mutant virus gifted with human intellect and cunning posed hazards exceeding Marek's worst imaginings, but all he envisioned was its one great advantage. Epidemic control had never been simpler. Zero was like a tumor Marek could go in and surgically remove. So the outbreak narrative, as I said earlier, becomes a, a struggle, an apocalyptic battle between on the one hand epidemiology and medical science, and on the other hand, these microbes representing a, an angry nature um, that have this mythic battle over the fate of humanity. This is exactly the message, again, that the 1989 conference was trying not to get across, right? So um, how does this look in more mundane, or I shouldn't say more mundane, in, in more sedate journalistic terms? So this is an image from uh, May, uh, May 5th, 2003 special issue on SARS, the previous uh, coronavirus. And um, the, the these images were on a facing pages as you see them and they were linked by the caption I've printed above. Fear of SARS prompts a Lufthansa crew to wear masks in the Hong Kong airport. The virus may have been may have been born on a farm like the one above in Guangzhou, China, where animals and people live close together. 
And the article went on, the novel coronavirus that causes the syndrome emerged from Guangdong, the same Chinese province that delivers new flu viruses to the world most years. Pigs, ducks, chickens, and people live cheek by jowl on the district's primitive farms, exchanging flu and cold germs so rapidly a single pig can easily incubate human and avian viruses simultaneously. The dual infections can generate hybrids that escape antibodies aimed at the originals, setting off a whole new chain of human infection. The clincher is that these farms sit just a few miles from Guangzhou, a teeming city that mixes people, animals, and microbes from the countryside with travelers from around the world. You could hardly design a better system for turning small outbreaks into big ones. So look at what this narrative is saying. We start with the primitive juxtaposed with the modern, right? And uh, this farm where the virus may have been born becomes the farm on which it was born um, is where people are living primitively cheek by jowl with their animals. The threat gets out into the world through the you know, modern city, the airport. Uh, expertise moves in the other direction, which was not historically true, but that's how the piece reported it. And it is the problem is contained by medical science and epidemiology. And again, I am not criticizing medical science and epidemiology. I'm just saying they're not enough. Right? That's what the scientists themselves are saying. They're not enough. Um, so what's wrong with this picture? Well, first of all, this isn't a picture of primitivism. This isn't people choosing to live cheek by jowl with their animals. It's an image of poverty. And poverty isn't something that emanates from the global south. It's a worldwide system that is imposed right, on the way certain people are forced to live. Um, it is not therefore a problem that is simply a medical problem to be solved by epidemiology and medical science, but a much larger problem about that involves global poverty, involves um, the environment, involves uh, the, the uh, development practices and globalization practices about which the 1989 conference was warning. So, um, I promised you I would come back to Alma Ada, and I'm almost done, and here I am. Um, so at the 30th anniversary of Alma Ada, Margaret Chan, the head at that time of the World Health Organization, made the theme for the year, Return to Alma Ada, and made it also the theme of the World Health Report, the WHO's World Health Report, uh, in October of that year, primary health care now more than ever. And what she says is, you know, what they said in Alma Ada was absolutely true. And what they proposed is really smart. It's really wise. So why aren't we doing it? And she says, you know, first and foremost, obviously, global poverty is a humanitarian issue. People should not have to live below minimum wage, below uh, uh, the poverty line, to, should not, should have adequate shelter and adequate uh, nutrition and access to medical care, uh, primary medical care. Secondly, it's a medical issue because there is no single vector that more effectively turns an outbreak into a pandemic than poverty, people living close together, people susceptible because of inadequate nutrition, uh, clothing, and shelter. And she says, and also it's economically wise. And she says, you know, when we think about something like global poverty or global health, it seems too large to address. But in fact, it makes financial sense to address it before it happens. It is, as I said, economically wise. If you go to the bottom of the page, I've thrown out some figures and they're, they're not exact. Um, the World Bank projections are constantly shifting. I've given a couple of sites where um, this kind of thing is discussed. But suffice it to say, the cost of a pandemic, even one that we're going through now, which is, which is magnitudes less than a, a serious avian flu uh, would be in terms of devastation. And, and my heart goes out to the millions of, of people who are suffering from this thing in all kinds of ways. But there are worse um, pandemics out there waiting. Um, I, I don't want to sound, uh, well, like my sensational stuff I look at, but... Um, and so it's estimated that a pandemic, a severe pandemic would cost in US dollars more than $3 trillion. And these figures were for, from a few years ago. Um, whereas the infrastructure, the cost of the infrastructural changes we'd need to make now across the world to build that universal access to primary health care, along with the uh, preparedness, the annual 
the budget for annual preparedness worldwide would be significantly less than the cost of a catastrophic flu. So why aren't we doing it? This is what Margaret Chen asked, this is my question. Obviously the answer is extremely complex, gets into politics, gets into economics, but I think the outbreak narrative can help us address why or, or understand or at least begin to approach this question and is, is part of it. And changing the story may begin us on the road to being able to address um, these questions. So how do we wanna tell the story of COVID-19? If you imagine yourself at the end of this, looking back, how will we tell the story? How should we tell the story? Do we wanna tell it as a story of medical science versus enemy microbes doing mythic battle for the fate of humanity or human beings acknowledging social responsibility for the world in which we all live together? So obviously when you're in the midst of, a, of an outbreak or a pandemic, crisis, this is a crisis and survival narrative. And obviously vaccine, pharmaceuticals and quarantine are the major tools we have at our disposal. But when we are done with this, I wanna urge people not to forget what this felt like and to ask ourselves, how do we wanna live more responsibly and more equitably in a global world? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Priscilla. That was um, absolutely wonderful. Um, we have, a, a, there's a, sh a short delay to the uh, YouTube streaming of about 30 seconds. So I'm gonna get us started off with um, the first uh, one or two questions. Um, oh, we actually have questions. Oh, they'll be coming up very shortly. So um, you've given us such a, an amazing broad sweep and so many, um, many of the different conflicting ways that this narrative has, has played out. Um, and I suppose one of the uh, ones which jumps out um, is this, and I've seen this idea of um, Gaia sociality. So I suppose it's the response to the idea of, you know, the earth is punishing us or another version is the earth is, um, uh, is like we're, we're bulking at making um, changes that we need for climate change. So the earth is saying, okay, well, try this or, you know, the earth or nature. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the solution is to develop a Gaia sociality so that we are, um, I suppose that's not so much focused on human equality, but on um, ecological equality or equity. So yeah, how do you think that's playing out? playing out in the sense of, are we doing it or how does it play out in the outbreak narrative? I'm, I'm not quite yeah, sure. Yeah, I suppose right whether, the, whether the outbreak narrative um, that we're seeing right now mm -hmm. um, is that, is the idea of the earth both as, um, in, as something that's punishing us or mm -hmm. um, uh, is, is that playing out differently in a context of climate change where we are you know, in parallel with dealing with this outbreak, many of us are wanting to promote different ways of uh, relating to the planet. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. And one of the things that the media has been talking about is how the fact that we're all staying home, how, how, uh, how it's improved the environment, that, you know, air pollution and animals are reclaiming cities and all kinds of things. And it's being sort of celebrated in that way. Um, so I do think that there is more awareness now than there was in 1995, more talk about um, the questions of the environment and how they're, how they're creating this problem and um, inequities, the way we're treating the planet, the way we're treating each other and so on. Um, there is more talk than there used to be, but I can't say I'm optimistic that this will continue in a serious and concerted way, because I'm also seeing all the biases that I've seen in the past. I'm seeing people, I mean, Asian people in the US were being beaten up. Um, businesses were being boycotted irrationally even before, obviously we were sheltering in, in place. So, you know, the, the China virus, the president referring to it as, as Kung flu and Wuhan flu, 
and being challenged on it and saying, I don't see the problem. So, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I see us making some progress and I see journalists writing more than they used to about the broader issues, about poverty, about um, social and geopolitical inequities that really need to be addressed, not, not for health reasons primarily, although that's an implication, but that the pandemic is showing us where our system is broken, what lives count more than other lives, I see that being written about in mainstream journalism much more than I did, you know, 25 years ago when I was first working on this. But um, but do I see real progress? Not yet. Do I hope I will? Yes. So some progress, but I suspend judgment. Yes, let's hope. Hope is all we <clears throat> all we have right now, really. Um, there's a, a question about the the invisibility of the microbe, mm -hmm. um, how, how it challenges our cognitive abilities in particular ways. So, have you thought about how the disease outbreak narrative as uh, an invisible enemy might vary from visible enemies? Yes, and I mean, this is why in the book I write about invasion of the body snatchers because I think that's definitely an outbreak narrative. And the idea that, and, and it's about healthy carriers, right? That you don't know who's infected and who's not and your exposure to them is, um, is gonna turn you into one of them. And also the zombie narratives. I mean, we have so many of these things. I do think that the invisibility gives the microbe more terror and more of a sense, and you know, an, an army fighting another army, there's fear, but there isn't terror. There isn't the same sense of something supernatural. And it's the invisibility in part that gives it that supernatural quality. And one of the things I find very interesting is the artistic renderings. You know, these things, and this is what Tom Geisbert is talking about in the hot zone, these things are beautiful and people are turning them into art. You know, you see that gorgeous picture of the coronavirus that is so deadly that we're, we're um, it, it's, you know, that we're totally um, at the mercy of, in a sense, and now I'm entering into the language I'm critical of. See, I told you it's not, you can't not. Um, and yet it's, it is beautiful. And I think that the, depictions of it are really interesting because I think they're an effort to make it visible, to make it less terrifying and less mysterious, but at the same time, they, they make it aesthetic. And I think, again, what Tom Geisbert is saying, it's mesmerizing in a way, in a way that an enemy combatant is not going to be mesmerizing. Mm, yeah, and I think also the aesthetics of uh, a shutdown. So all the all the the, the nature returning, all of those images, images of like you know, thousands of planes all in a row, empty streets, all of this. I think that's um, in some ways another aesthetic depiction of yes. the virus's wake and of invisibility. It's our absence that's terrifying. It's not a group of sick people that would be less terrifying than nobody in the airport where they're supposed to be. Nobody on Broadway in Manhattan, right? Nobody on you know, the Champs-Elysees in Paris. That's terrifying in a way. And that, that's also where people start comparing it to war. But we're in our houses without an enemy. We are the enemy. And so again, that's the temptation of turning the virus into a zombie, into a monster, into and a militaristic foe, something we can have dignity and heroism in fighting, when in fact it's a it's a thing without consciousness that we have brought into our world, right? We've created the opportunity for it, and mm -hmm. that's that's terrifying and hard to contemplate. Yeah, and so and maybe the, the, you did make comments about. Um, the virus uh, from this popular um, science literature that who has a, a, a motive without a mind 
it's, it's an innovator, it's selfish. And then there's also the that great line from Contagion that we don't need to weaponize bird flu. The birds are already doing that. <laughs> yep. Yeah. You want is that a question? I mean um, No, you mean you're welcome to to well I'll, I'll, no, no, I, I might I, move. I, I, yeah, I might move to um, another question which we have, which is um, related to something very uh, topical that's just happened in Australia, which is that we've launched a, a contact tracing app. Uh, mm -hmm. It's also happened in uh, Singapore, Hong Kong and about to happen in Germany. Um, we've had very high uptake, I think over 2 million um, out of uh, what they the, they want 10 million people to download it, 40% of the population. And it tracks uh, through Bluetooth whether you have been in contact with someone for more than 15 minutes within 1.5 metres uh, to aid in contact tracing. So do you have, you know, a view um, given your scholarship on outbreak narratives, whether this is something that we should do or whether the particular the, the technology creep and surveillance creep and the potential to reinforce inequalities um, is, is a, a too much of a danger. So this is the fundamental public health paradox that, um, and I think of somebody like Typhoid Mary or Gaetan, you know, Mary Mallon, Typhoid Mary, Gaetan Dugas, pa patient zero, that they, the healthy care, right? That, that what we have in public health is we want to protect the health of everyone. We have a right to health, right? And this is going to, to do that. In those cases, it's a little bit different, but I'll come back to, to the uh, question you've asked. In those cases, it was one individual, but those individuals stood in for the population in the sense that do you violate somebody's privacy and rights if you perceive them to be a threat to public health? And that's what this technology is right in the heart of, right? So, you know, we, I mean, I'll, I'll leave aside for the moment how this technology might get used after the um, public health emergency is over, right? I mean, and I do think that um, in Australia, from what I've been reading, safeguards are being built into that, you know, that this won't be used for other things and, and it won't give access to, you know, all kinds of privacy things, it's just, to tell you who you've been around, but that tells you a lot. And then what do you do with that information? Are you gonna criminalize somebody who doesn't restrict their motions? And when you do that, you're putting the certain rights in the population against other rights. And obviously these are culturally very different, right? Different cultures value those rights in different hierarchies. Personally, I would have no problem downloading the app. I feel that I want to know if I've been around someone so that I can protect other people. You know, I, I have a very strong sense. I, my fear when all of this started because I flew from New York right before we sheltered in place in North Carolina and I was terrified I was going to give this to somebody. I mean, I really, I did not leave my house except to go outside when no one was around at six in the morning because this was, you know, terrifying for me. And so I would happily give over my right to privacy for that. But I also understand that people wouldn't. And there's a whole history of people being demonized and cr criminalized. And Gaetan Dugas is a perfect example that because of Randy Schultz's book and the band played on, people, this, this poor guy had a burden of being the guy who brought AIDS to America, which was absurd being a criminal who was deliberately infecting people, which from everything I can gather subsequently was not the case. What he was was someone cooperating with epidemiologists and remembering all these contacts and, and giving them really important information. And so those examples give me pause and make me understand why people don't, don't wanna do the contact tracing. And also I have white privilege. So it's a less risky thing for me than it is for a lot of people. So I think it's, I have a mixed answer for you. Mm. So in me. some ways, when we're being asked by health authorities to take on a carrier subjectivity to say, I am act as if you're carrying it, that mm. is something that's very bonding, but also uh, still will uh, reinforce divisions between those people for whom that's really not an option. Oh, right. And people who are sick will get stigmatized also. 
But again, I, what I like about this is that it is voluntary. If it were mandatory, I would have more problems with it. But as a voluntary thing, I think it's a very good idea. I think it's very important. Um, and I would volunteer. Um, do we have a, another another question about climate change? Um, there's been questions, I think we've covered the, the um, links between uh, climate change and the pandemic, which as you said, have been much more, um, a, much more prominent in media coverage in this outbreak versus other ones. But there's a question about the climate change narrative. And I don't know if this is something that you've thought about. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen early on in the pandemic, um, climate change should get uh, COVID-19's PR or something of that kind of meme that, you know, and especially, especially young people, but all of us who are concerned about the climate, we've been trying to get everyone to panic and now everybody's panicking about something else. So do you have clues about how to um, transfer this panic, uh, climate change, as the questioner points out, is also an invisible threat. Mm -hmm. And also climate change for me, and I, I, um, I've worked a little bit on this in the past, climate change for me is the one non-communicable disease thing that works like an outbreak narrative, because it does have, you know, it has the border, the crossing border, element, it's um, differential in many of the same ways. You know, it involves a lot of the same issues and, and uh, discourse. But I think that's a great question of how to transfer it. And I've been thinking a lot about this. And I think it's important to see the way that the outbreak narrative is working against the environmental narrative, right? And I'm trying to think of um, the Marvel, the really, uh, the Marvel, the real popular Marvel, Marvel film and I'm, I'm hopeless. I'm not going to help oh, you. Oh, I just can't think of it. And oh, and I loved it. I saw it three times. But anyway, the great villain who destroys, you know, a significant, I think it's what, a third of the population or whatever, is um, doing it for environmental reasons, right? So that villain is so characteristic. And so I, you know, I, I think it's important to point that out and to see how subtly there's kind of a blame um, environmentalists are, are somehow blamed for this. What I would like to see is more and more analysis of um, the ways in which climate change and environmental devastation generally more broadly than climate change is responsible or significant, a, a significant factor in, um, in uh, the outbreaks and in turning them into pandemics, including the fact that climate change is increasing the number of people who live in abject poverty. So I think that um, the more it's, that's not that hard to understand. It's not like a super complicated point. And what I'm hoping is that journalists will write about that more and more. And maybe the way in is talking about how everything on that front got better when we all moved indoors. And maybe we need to, maybe this is a, a, a kick in the pants that we need to change those everyday practices for both of these reasons in order to survive. Although I don't like talking about survival, I really prefer the idea of living equitably, um, but both are true. I mean, there, there is, of course, um, COVID denial, um, but it's, it's extremely, as far as I'm aware, extremely marginal and pathologized. Um, mm -hmm. But climate change denial is, you know, much more um, mainstream and, you know, many politicians, unfortunately, um, as in Australia and yours as well, uh, if not outright support it, at least entertain it or do this kind of implicit messaging to their climate denialist constituents. So, I mean, because COVID does, does affect everyone in the same way, um, obviously in very differential rates, uh, yes. you know, how, how can we make climate denial seem as ridiculous as COVID denial? It seems to me, and, and again, I mean, we're going to lose some people, but it seems to me that what COVID has done is, at least I'm seeing this in the United States, it seems to have gotten a lot of people to pay attention in a new way. Um, and they're paying attention, they're having this experience, everybody's affected by this experience differentially, 
but everybody's affected. It's affecting the economy, everything, right? And so I think using that experience and as people are coming out of this, I mean, the danger is people wanna forget, but this is something people are not gonna be able to forget. People are gonna be traumatized. Using that to say, how can we prevent this? Everybody is gonna to wanna to know, not everybody, the vast majority is gonna to wanna to know how to prevent this in the future. If there is a way, right, and there should be, for journalists to just walk through the connection between environmental devastation and outbreaks and pandemics, I think it will get people, and this is what I was saying earlier, I think that step-by-step -step connection might get people to pay attention because COVID-19, the COVID-19 experience is the grounding experience. We've got this, we, it's horrible, we don't want it to come back. What can we do to make this come back? Well, we have to take seriously the connection to environmental devastation not just climate change, but the whole of environmental devastation, which includes, in my, the way I use it, includes climate change, careless development patterns, et cetera, um, over mining, you know, all of it, not paying attention to the, the effects short-term and long-term that, um, that our current practices have. The US is the worst offender, right? Mm, yeah, it's it's a very difficult question. I mean, we've had, before this particular disaster, we've had the bushfire disaster in Australia over last summer. And one would think, I mean, I think that um, linking a, a pandemic to climate change might be a bigger stretch than linking massive bushfires related to drought um, to climate change and just uh, catastrophic fire weather. But it's actually been really difficult and the government um, has uh, supported or this, this uh, idea that, again, environmentalists are to blame because environmentalists have been opposing land clearing and we need to clear land so that there can't be fires there. Um, now, these are all, you know, these are environmental, these are empirical questions, but... Um, no, it's obvious, it's pretty ridiculous to be blaming environmentalists. But yeah, it's been very devastating to see that level of um, uh, level of debate, and we have to have these debates over and over again. So I suppose that doesn't give me that much hope about the ability to link pandemics to climate change. I I think that's right. I think though, I mean, yes, I obviously agree with you. But my hope is maybe all these things together, you know, one disaster after another, after another, and the economic effects of those disasters. So one, the one thing that I think could get people's attention is, and it hasn't in the past, but maybe now with the economy going where it's going, is the Margaret Chan argument, the World Bank argument, the WHO argument, right? That this dealing with these problems is more expensive than doing the infrastructural and behavioral changes to prevent them. So if this, I mean, to me, the reason for the climate denial, et cetera, is among other things, but I think primary, not, I don't wanna say it's, it's a lot of things, but um, economics is a big part of it, right? We don't wanna change our economics. We don't wanna change, you know, how business is working and so on. So if we make an economic argument about the cost of a pandemic, the cost of the wildfires, et cetera, and how this is adding up, the economic argument might push some people who need to be pushed over this line. I wish I knew. Yeah, I mean, we've I all been saying so. this for a long time. You know, the, the, the disease itself, all of the stuff, People were predicting this decades ago. One of the, the guys who was a participant in the conference wrote a book in 1981 called The Restless Tide or something like that. I can't remember the exact how restless is in the title, all about how we were setting ourselves up for a pandemic and all the, the globalization and environmental devastation, all these things being major factors in it, 1981. 
George Perkins Marsh was saying it in the 19, in the 1860s. I mean, not about pandemics, but so uh, I, I agree with your despair, but let's try to be hopeful. Um, there's a, another question about uh, science communication. So I suppose the, the experts, the scientists, um, you described how you know, we see uh, how it's particularly ex northern expertise is, is represented. Um, I, I'm not sure if the question is getting at that northern versus southern um, uh, dimension, but do you think that uh, scientific expertise will be seen differently after this pandemic? Yeah, I hope so. And I should say, by the way, that I'm aware that Global South and Global North are complicated and changing terms. And I'm talking to people in Australia, I'm fully aware those are shorthand symbolic terms um, that are not adequate, but okay. Um, so I do think, I, so, and I can speak for the US here. I do think that there has been a shift in how people are listening to scientists when people watch people getting sick and dying. And as those numbers go up, um, people want to hear from Anthony Fauci more than they want to hear from he who shall not be named, no, uh, Donald, Donald Trump. Um, and I think, um, I think that, I, I hope so. But again, I think there's a, there's a group of people who are going to deny that as well and are going to stick to their guns and there's not literally, and there's not much, you know, one hopes to get through to as many people as possible and to the people who, who are receptive, um, but haven't been involved. And one thing I do think is that people who have been like indifferent to all of it, I don't care about these debates, it doesn't affect me, who are reasonable people who just have been eh, apathetic or just fed up or whatever, are definitely coming on board with this and saying, we've got to do something and people have to listen to the scientists. So that I think can shift some of the discourse. But again, I'm trying to be hopeful. And I, you know, this book came out in 2008 and I don't have much to add to it. Not much has changed in 12 years. And that's really disturbing to me. Yeah, and just the the um, prescience of also c contagion and other movies like the images of the um, mass graves uh, that we've seen almost exactly um, uh, play out in in so many countries in the world, um, and the full extent of the disease in so many of the what we might call the global south is still just emerging and probably we don't really, it's, it's going to be hard to get in, good information about that. Mm -hmm. So I suppose uh, this leads us to this idea of the um, epidemiology of belonging, which is a really uh, powerful concept in your book. Um, and relating to the, the pandemic as reenacting re a primordial struggle for existence, something very um, basic to uh, human society. Uh, so how do we um, understand this idea of, you know, of solidarity? And certainly we've seen so much of that with iconic images like the Italians making music on their balconies and in Australia, probably maybe in the US as well, kids doing chalk drawings um, outside their, um, their houses. Um, so that idea of solidarity versus the incredible deepening of social divisions um, that's going on within neighbourhoods in the US, uh, accessing healthcare, accessing testing. Yeah. I mean, yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, you know, it's, it goes back to what I was saying about contagion as an analogue for being human. You know, there, and, and I think the mask is a wonderful symbol because do you wear the mask to primarily protect yourself or primarily protect other people? And the discourse in the US has been, well, it's really more to prepare to, to uh, protect other people. And, um, you know, I think it, I, I, most people I talk to are wearing it 
because they're afraid. I mean, I think they're doing it for both. I don't think people want to make other people sick, but I think that it's more, you know, this is gonna almost ritualistically keep me safe. Because the fact is, how much are the makeshift masks we're, we're making? I mean, there's something, but how much are they gonna protect us if we're sneezed on or coughed on or whatever? Um, whereas it will block a lot of the virus if we sneeze or cough through our mask. So to me, it's a wonderful symbol potentially to remind people that we are social beings and that I might, if I take a risk for myself, I'm also putting other people at risk. You know, it goes back to the, the question of the app, who's going to download the app and, and where you put your priorities. But a lot of that, as I said before, have to do also with privilege because the, the people who benefit most from a society, ideally, should be willing to take on that burden. I mean, that, but they're often the people who are at least, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting off target here. But I, but I do think that there is something almost mystical. In fact, I would, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna say it is mystical. There is something mystical about the experience, about sharing the experience, about realizing you're in it together. And that's what I was saying before about susceptibility, about also realizing you're in contact with strangers. You are in intimate contact with strangers. And the invisibility of the microbes is part of that mysticism. It really does become an emblem of community. It also, like any crisis, brings out the best in people and the worst in people. It brings out the we're in this together and it brings out the us versus them. And those two things coexist. And they're, to me, always going to coexist. And <clears throat> my, my goal is to push harder on the stories that emphasize the former, the we're in this together, the responsible for each other, the communal feelings versus the us them. Um, so we have another question um, really um, building on that. So if we are looking for new narratives of, of being together or whether it's being alone together or the fact that borders are not uh, immaterial in many ways for, for some people and for, for microorganisms. Um, are there other domains of life where we might look for these um, outside science or, or popular science? Um, are there you know, non-medical ideas about uh, being, in the, being in it together? And well, I suppose well, climate change is, is, is one of them. Oh, you mean other issues? Because I was going to say religion is all about yeah. this. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think they're med medicine and mysticism, religion, you know, they're really, they're all coming together in this. Um, I mean, that's what you and I were just talking about. That's the epidemiology of belonging. Um, the epidemiology of belonging, by the way, is also unintended, right? It's, it's, it means whether you like it or not. Um, and, you know, it's about herd immunity too, whether you like it or not. Um, you are in this together. I mean, well, anyway, I'm not, again, it's late at night for me. I'm not, I'm, I'm not the giggler, not going to go down that trail, but the, um, but the going back to that question, yes, I do think climate change would be another example of that, but the, but it's, it's the ways in which, but that's still science. It's the ways in which science picks up on these mystical, supernatural, you can call them religious, but religion brings in morality and ethics. And this is the place where moral boundaries blur, right? That's the Tom Geisbert thing. It's really much more, I mean, what Rudolf Otto, who wrote a book called The Idea of the Holy, an early theorist philosopher of this, talks about, calls it the numinous. It's the irrational feeling of transcendence. And I think that that element is what makes this discourse so powerful. And the idea for me is to harness that power towards something positive, to try consciously to say, you know, let's, let's really think about the inequities that are being pointed out and let's take that communal feeling and channel it into 
responsibility isn't a word I love. I keep using it, but I into something that's that's more equitable. That that's about commitment and um, equitability, if that makes sense. Yeah, to try and uh, channel the panic in a productive way. Um, the and that there is the fellow feeling, right? Mm. The fellow feeling is is the thing. You know, the panic, I think, is what makes us do us them. The fellow feeling, the sense of empathy, of um, realizing how, how we're connected in this, again, this sort of mystical way, like the virus is almost like a communion in a strange way. And communitas, Victor Turner would say, that feeling of something larger, the numinous, the the um, otherworldly, that's the thing that is irrational and can sway either way. Whereas I think panic sways us invariably to the negative. Mm. And yeah, I mean, that of course there's that uh, paradox that we feel in this communitas or we're uh, and hopefully feeling this in a time when we're all isolated within our nuclear families and many people um, completely alone. Um, but then if we think about, you know, the crowd um, and you cover in your book, you know, really brilliant um, discussion of, of social contagion, which is a whole, uh, and a whole other direction the conversation could go. But the ability to crowd, of crowds to um, often take people on, in, on the wrong paths Right. Um, or paths that are destructive. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, we have a question about, about mental health and individual mental health and people who um, are a very long way from feeling uh, solidarity um, and the, uh, I, the increase in suicides that um, I haven't really seen much data about this, but it would certainly make sense um, that... Uh, people's mental health is is being severely affected by quarantine and that's one of the reasons I am really um, uh, I actually support this uh, contact tracing app as well clearly also from a position of privilege but I do uh, want people who are really suffering in isolation to be able to um, to get better mm -hmm. um, yeah so that how what do you think about how, is that part of the outbreak narrative at all i suppose it's a very uh, specific um experience of isolation but it's certainly very prominent to all of us today yeah i don't feel that i can really comment on that it's it's not something i've looked at at all in the context of the outbreak narrative because the outbreak narrative is really about populations more than individuals um and I don't have any expertise in it. And I, I am concerned, obviously, and um, worried about that. Yeah, I'm, you know, I've thought a lot. I mean, it, it, one of the things that I, I found really interesting about this is I said jokingly to a friend of mine, if I lived alone and had no pets, I don't know what I do. I'm missing hugging people and touching people. And I have, my husband's here, my children are elsewhere. Um, and I said, I, I honestly said sort of joking, but I would go out and hug a tree. And I thought I really would. And um, it's, it turns out people are being told to do that. You know, this is my point about how we need each other. The, the, it's, we are social beings. We cannot, we are not made to live in isolation. And there are some people who are hermits, who are perfectly figuratively and literally, who are perfectly happy, but they are the minority. Most people really need community. And so I've been very concerned about it, but I don't have anything, I don't think I have any wisdom to bring to that at all. I wish I did. Yeah, I mean, you talk about how I'll quote, the disease emergence dramatizes the dilemma that inspires the most basic of human narratives, the necessity and the danger of human contact. Right. And I suppose that's really um, been uh, crystallized for us. So do you think that on the other yes. side of this, people will be uh, more aware of the, the danger of human contact? I think... Yes, and I'm worried about that. 
Um, and I hear people saying, I actually heard Dr. Fauci say, you know, people shouldn't shake hands. Like even when this is done, people shouldn't shake hands. And I thought, I don't want to live. I mean, there are other ways to greet people. And for a while until things are in balance or whatever, you know, obviously we want to be more careful, but touching and hugging it doesn't necessarily mean hands, but touching and hugging is so important. I don't want us to lose that. I think, I mean, if you ask me about mental illness, my guess would be that mental illness would come, would be heightened by our fearing to be close to each other. And I really, I don't know how people are gonna get past this. I think this is a very traumatic, traumatizing experience. And I'm not sure how people are gonna get at the other end. I just like, I was thinking about this today. I can't wait to be able to hug people again. I mean, that's the thing I most miss. Um, but, and the other thing I'm worried about is a kind of germ phobia, you know, that, okay, good public health sense during flu season, of course, wash your hands, you know, more, keep your hands away from your face. These are all good practices, but we also don't want to get to the point where we become um, germ phobic in a, in a crazy way and where we, I mean, dirt and germs and all of that exposure also strengthens the immune system. And we give each other immunity. That's, that's part of the epidemiology of belonging. That's part of this mystical thing I'm talking about. And I don't mean to, you know, sound new age about it. It's literally, that's how people experience it or write about it. Um, and I don't, I don't want us to lose some of the most basic and important things about our world and become terrified to be together. So um, I, I don't think we can. I think we will for a while, but then that's the good part of what we'll forget. You know, I don't want us to forget the lessons of, of the social and geopolitical inequities, of the climate change, of the environmental devastation, all of that. But I do want us to forget or at least come to terms with the, the trauma that keeps us apart from each other. Yeah, I think that is beautiful. And um, I know it's very late for you. So I'm thinking that might be a good place to um, allow you to uh, resume your usual uh, programming. Um, and I also want to uh, show everyone um, share my screen and show you um, the flyer for our next series, which is just next week. So it's going to be um, another really interesting uh, discussion about with uh, Associate Professor Evan Kirksey, um, who is uh, our colleague at Deakin University, but is in currently in Maryland, uh, isolating, uh, and he'll be talking about the emergence of COVID-19 as a multi-species story, um, touching on uh, some of the, the themes that we only just um, passed over. Um, but I think that will be uh, uh, also a really interesting discussion. Um, but uh, thank you so much, Priscilla. I have incredibly enjoyed um, our conversation and thank you so much for, for your time um, in the evening. I know I'm not very... Um, not very articulate at that time of night. I think um, I'm just not articulate. I, can I just say also, <laughs> thank you everyone for your great questions. And if anybody has a question that you really wanted to ask, you didn't get to ask, please feel free to email me pwald at duke.edu. Thank you. Excellent. We'll, we'll, we'll pop your email address um, on the, the chat as well. Uh, and I also want to tell everyone to read the book. Um, it is a brilliant book. It is completely downloadable right now, which is um, in, amazing of Duke University Press, a real public service. And it is perfect bedtime reading. It, it covers um, race, gender, belonging, you know, so many more issues in um, uh, incredible um, historical and, and cultural depth. So... Uh, I recommend it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for coming to the seminar, guys.